Well, friends and brethren, I want to ask this question. Uh, when does anger become a sin? When does anger become a sin? Turn with me to Amos chapter 1 and verse 11. You know, sometimes it's very interesting. So, things in history do have a way of, you know, if repeating, rhyming, whatever it may be, and there are lessons. The Bible gives us all sorts of fascinating lessons that sometimes we just read right over or pass over. But these things have, a, and, and God wants us to learn something from these things. He wants us to understand something. So if let's go to Amos. He's one of the Old Covenant prophets, Hebrew prophets. You know, chapter 1 and verse 11, and I'm going to read this in the Amplified Bible version here. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom. Who was Edom? These were the descendants of Esau. You know, we have the whole story that you'll find in Genesis uh, that, you know, you have, uh, you had Jacob and Esau. This, these were the children of uh, Isaac and Rebekah. And there's a fascinating, it's a fascinating story of how the Bible will talk about, in some ways, things that began long ago that are continuing even unto this day. So thus is the Lord for three transgressions of Edom, these descendants of Esau, and for four, that is, you know, this, it's a Hebrew way of saying for multiplied delinquencies. You know, this started of the thing. It's just a, you know, it's a figure of speech from that standpoint for three to four. I will not reverse its punishment or revoke my word concerning it. And, you know, this this place, when you look at where Edom anciently lived, you know, it's, it's now, you know, mostly... You know, it's 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 not one of those great fertile regions of the world. It's it's uh, it's not populated. You know, it's not like settled areas of Vancouver or you know great areas of the American Midwest. You know, for the most part, this area is it's a really dry area. You know, there's still Bedouin living in this area. You know, this Edom was also known, you know, specifically during Roman times as Idumea. You know, remember Herod the Great was an Idumean, okay? He was, in other words, an Edomite who had actually come into and been, came into and was leading the people of Judah at that time. But it's sometimes known as, as uh, Edom is known as Idumea. Um, but in ancient times, this land was fertile, it was prosperous, its people were, were, you know, quite one of the more considerable and powerful of Israel's neighbors, ancient Israel's neighbors. They were on the east, or if you want to put it this way, southeast. But there is incredible amount of jealousy and rival breaking out uh, at times into open hostilities that prevailed between Edom and the children of Israel, whether it was the kingdom of Israel and Judah or during the time of the combined kingdom of Saul and David. You'll see this throughout the scriptures. When you read in the Bible, you know, through, through um, Samuel or Kings or Chronicles, you'll, you'll see this coming out and we'll visit some of this. So there were, you know, there were times, there was periodic, episodic times of hostilities would prevail or break out between these two peoples. And it's all prefigured in the story. In the scriptures, you have this whole story of Jacob and Esau, really even from their birth when you go back in there and you look at it. Now, the capital of ancient Edom was known as Selah, and today uh, we would call it Petra. Petra is remarkably situated, you know, this, this city was in a hollow, uh, shut in uh, by mountain cliffs and accessible only through two narrow defiles. Uh, other cities of, of ancient Edom that you'll, you'll see in the Bible were known as Timan and Basra. These were two of the principal cities of ancient Edom. So, you know, God says that for three transgressions of Edom and for four, that's the multiplied delinquencies, I will not reverse its punishment or revoke my word concerning it. Why? Why wouldn't God revoke his punishment of Edom? What he had forecast and what he prophesied in the pages of the Bible, and we'll read some of that, of what, what would come. And it says, it explains it here. Amos explains it in Amos 1, verse 11. Because he pursued his brother Jacob, that is Israel, with the sword. 
Let's go to, let's read this in um, Second Chronicles. Uh, Second Chronicles 28, verse 17. I want to just read this. He pursued his brother Jacob with a sword. In Second Chronicles 28, 17, he's just going to pull one verse out of here. And it's towards the end of Chronicles. It said, For the Edomites had come again and attacked Judah and led away captives. You know, this verse suggests, you know, the, the, the laconic way the, 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 the verse expressed it. He said, it's, uh, there were sort of habitual invasions by the Edomites. You know, the specific invasion in this case wasn't it didn't even seem worth mentioning it seems like a sum up that the you know the covenant people's expression you know the old the church of the, uh, the church of the old covenant you know the writer who is setting down chronicle he's, he's saying that well Edom's coming and they've done it one more time they've been in the habit of doing it when he when the chronicles was written for almost a millennium periodically because he pursued his brother Jacob with the sword. Edom had this lasting, you know, enmity against Israel. Yet God, on the part of Israel, required the Israelites to remember that these Edomites were their brethren, and it told them they had to treat them well, and they had to respect them. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 1. Deuteronomy 2 and verse 1. I'm going to read this in the expanded Bible version. Deuteronomy 2 verse 1. Now you know Deuteronomy was written shortly um, before the children of Israel were going to go into their promised land. It was a recap. It was like a rehearsal, you know, an, an exhortation that Moses was giving. This is sort of like his, his last big work, and he was explaining to everybody, you know, what was going on, what would it all was about, this sort of thing. So in Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 1, Moses is, you know, and he, imagine him, he's standing there talking to a bunch of people, a, a large crowd. Then we turned around and we traveled on the desert road to the Red Sea, as the Lord had told me to do. And this is his account, his narrative. And we traveled through the mountains of Edom. Some verses will say Seir, but it's, a, but it's, a, it's the same. It's, they, they're, they're interchangeable terms for Edom. Uh, from the mountains of Edom for many days. Then the Lord said to me, you've traveled through these mountains long enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, turn north and give the people this command. You will soon go through the land that belongs to your relatives. Or in many verses, it'll say your brethren, your brothers, the descendants of Esau who live in Edom. They will be afraid of you, but be very careful. Do not go to war against them. I will not give you any of their land, not even a foot of it. Okay, you're on your way to the promised land, but it's not going to be part of Edom. No, they would actually go farther up the valley, and then they would take out some of the kings of the Amorites. But God did not allow them to touch Edom's land. And he told them, I'm not going to give you any of their land, not even a foot of it, because I have given the mountains of Edom to Esau as his own. See, Jacob, he was providing a promised land, but Edom had a promised land too. It wasn't that God just ignored, you know, Jacob's brother Edom or Esau. No, he, he, he gave him a place where he could dwell. Let's go to Deuteronomy 23 in verse 7. Later on, God was saying, okay, how, how are you to relate to these people? Because, you know, ancient Israel under the old covenant, you know, a lot of people who were foreigners... You know, it, it, it took a while. They just couldn't come in necessarily and be part of the congregation or, if you want to say, in, uh, immigrate and integrate into Israel as uh, somebody who was a native born for some time sometimes. You know, for the, for the uh, Ammonites, I guess, uh, and, you know, it was like going to be 10 generations, you know, some of these things. You know, some people had to adjust for a long time. But he says this. He told, he told uh, the Hebrews, he said this about the, the Edomites in Deuteronomy 23 and verses 7. Uh, I'm going to read, start with verse 7 in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Do not despise an Edomite. Don't despise them. 
because he is your brother. Do not despise an Egyptian because you were a foreign resident in his land. The children born to them in the third generation may enter the Lord's assembly. So God, you know, gave them favorable treatment because of their relationship, their, his, their personal history, you know, as peoples with the, with the children of Israel, with the Hebrews. Don't despise an Edomite because he is your brother. I suppose that's probably one reason why Herod the Great could have a certain amount of acceptance when he came along because even though they knew he was an Edomite in his background, he, had, he was practicing the religion, they accepted him. I mean, he was marginally accepted at least. So when we look at this, you know, Israel had these admonitions. You can't take their land. I've given it to them. You know, don't despise them. He's your brother. They were repeatedly exhorted this, but yet the relationship historically between Edom and ancient Israel, or ancient the kingdom of Judah too, was very sad, very difficult. And, you know, they had constantly, you know, as I mentioned, you know, so Edom came in and they invaded the land and took people captive. You know, it was a repeated thing. So when we go back to why would God not, why would God not reverse? Why would God not change his mind about Edom's prophesied punishment? That, Isaac, that the prophet Amos was talking about in Amos 1, verse 11. He gives a reason. God gives a reason why when he, you know, he says something, there's going to be some punishment coming, and I'm not changing my mind because I've seen this, and it continues on. And it says here in Amos 1, 11, because he pursued his brother Jacob with the sword pursued his brother Jacob with the sword. This is not, you know, I attacked him. No, it's pursuing is to go after him and to continue to go after him and to chase him and to continue to go after him. Let's go. Let's read in the scriptures. Uh, open your Bibles to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 5. We're going to look at something here. A story. It's a story that's going to sort of illustrate maybe some of the differences between the, the, the ancient covenant people of God and some of the brethren who they didn't get along with. And it's going to explain something of why God is not reversing. Well, God is, you know, is still intent on punishing Edom because he pursued his brother Jacob with a sword. Second Chronicles 20, verse 5, Amplified Bible Version. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem, and Jehoshaphat would be counted among the righteous kings of, of Judah from this standpoint. Okay, he wasn't one of the unrighteous ones, but he was a righteous, uh, you know, he would have been counted as a righteous one. So he stood, uh, and the, you know, they had an assembly in the house of the Lord, God's temple there in Jerusalem, in front of the courtyard, and said, and of course, the reason they had gathered is because we'll find out here just in a second. O oh Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? So he's asking a rhetorical question, you know, sort of like, aren't you in charge? So I couldn't possibly imagine a leader in, in the 21st century in most of the Western nations standing up and, you know, before, you know, getting before the TV or whatever, say, you know, oh, Lord, God of our fathers, aren't you God in heaven? No, I don't see most of them doing that today. And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? Yeah. When you look at the Old Covenant scriptures, you see God took an interest of what went on in all, all sorts of different nations. He had a hand in. He didn't completely, let, let, you, know, you know, he didn't, he, he wouldn't, he, 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 you, you see this. Power and might are in your hand. There is no one able to take a stand against you. O oh, our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? So, 
Jehoshaphat is recounting, how did we get the title deed to this piece of land, the promise, the land, how did we get it? Well, because God gave it to us. He drove out the people who were there before because they were, you know, morally despicable in God's sight. He took it away from it and gave it to the children of Israel. Verse 8, they have lived in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if evil comes on us or the sword or judge of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand before in this house and before you for your name and your presence is in this house and we will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear and save us. Jehoshaphat is recounting what an earlier king, what Solomon had said at the dedication of the temple. It was a place where, as you would, heaven and earth met, it was where the nation would meet with God because God's presence would be in the temple. That was the idea of it. And of course, the Shekinah, the glory of God, had descended upon the temple. And the people still would say, you know, we can come before you in your presence, stand before you and say, we're in trouble. We need your help. And they don't say what. Verse 10. Now, Behold, the sons of Ammon and Moab and Edom, you know, Ammon and Edom were descendants of Lot, Abraham's nephew, and Edom was one of their brethren, descendants of Esau, Jacob or Israel's brother. Now behold, the sons of Adam, Ammon and Edom, uh, Moab and Edom, whom you would not allow Israel to evade when they came from the land of Israel, for they turned away from them and did not destroy them. You know, talking about something that occurred about, no, oh, I don't know, at this point in time, um, 600 some odd years, getting on to 700 years earlier. Here they are, rewarding us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given us as an inheritance. So these other nations who were related to the Israelites say, hmm, we like the real estate over there too. We would like that. <laughs> we want your place. We're going to push you out of it. We're going to make it so miserable for you that we're going to drive you out into exile and take it for ourselves. Verse 12, O our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless against this great multitude that is coming against us. So at that point in time, Judah didn't have much of an army. They were sort of in a, you know, their previous rulers hadn't been very good and their defenses, you know, were weak. Their defenses were weak. We do not what to do, but our eyes are on you. So Jehoshaphat, because he was a righteous king, realized that, well, our, our strength has got to be in, a God, in our God because we can't look to our weapons or ourselves or we're going to lose. I mean, it's obvious to us, we, you know, we can't stand against these, you know, we don't have the strength of military might. Verse 13, so all Judah stood before the Lord with their infants, their wives, and their children. Then in the midst of the assembly, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jehiel, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph. So one of the descendants of the people, one of the major writers of the Psalms. And God's Spirit came upon him, and he gave this word for God. Verse 15, he said, Listen carefully, all you people of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, the Lord says this to you, Do not be afraid or, dism or dismayed at this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God. You see, all the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Edomites, these relatives of Israel were coming to, you know, to take over their land and to kill them or take them as slaves. So they, they had this troubled history with people who were lived right next to them. You want to put it, their neighbors. People who were even in the you know, distant part of their family. And they, 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 had, this, they, had, they, they had this continual trouble. Because, you know, why he, he, he pursued his brother Jacob with a sword. Let's go back to Amos 1 and verse 11. Very, very dense verse here. There's a lot of meaning in this. Amos 1 and verse 11. Because he pursued his brother Jacob Israel with a sword, corrupting 
Why did he, how was he doing it? How is he doing this continually over such a long period of time? Corrupting and stifling his compassions and casting off all mercy. Oh, as, an, as a nation, they were corrupting and stifling how they looked at, you know, the, the Israelites. They, they had all this resentment. And instead of, it says, you know, this idea literally, it's, the Hebrew literally is say, Edom corrupted or destroyed his compassion. This was, this was a conscious thought. You say, well, how do, you know, it, it suppressed or stifled the natural instinct of tender regard which a person would normally cherish towards a relative, a brother, a cousin, which would render it impossible, you know, if you had that natural compassion, you wouldn't be out there pursuing him from generation to generation with the sword. The Hebrew word here for corrupted, you know, or stifling his, you know, corrupted or stifling his compassions is, is the Hebrew word is Strong's 7843. It's shachaf, shachaf. To destroy, for something to put, you know, to, to to ruin something, to spoil it. So Edom was ruining it. It was spoiling. It was suppressing any natural tenderness or warm feeling or you know compassion that they might have for people who they knew, you know, were their brethren. Edom did violence. To his normal human feelings, God initially gives to all people. Somehow they were, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of like they were teaching, you know, from generation to generation, they were teaching their kids to hate. Where do you see this today? Yeah, this is still, this sort of attitude is still going on. It really is. You know, why do you think, why do you think the Palestinian Israeli conflict is still going on after all these years. Israel's been around for 70 years. You know, they're able to make peace with the, able to make peace with the uh, Egyptians. They're able to make peace with the Jordanians. Can they make peace with the Palestinians? No. Because many ways when you, you know, and this is one of the things that you, you, you see is that in their schools they continually teach hatred to the kids from generation to generation. And, you know, they, you know, and it's not going to be solved. This is the thing the world doesn't understand about this conflict of, in the Middle East. Edom did violence to his normal human feelings that God initially gives to all people. He corrupted and destroyed them. He suppressed them. He stifled them. He strangled them. And he did it, curiously, in the way the scriptures say, and recount that the prophet Ezekiel would say that the king of Tyre would do to his wisdom. Fascinating. That is to say, he, the king of Tyre would pervert his wisdom just as the Edomites would pervert their natural compassion to keep it from fulfilling the purposes for which God originally gave either the wisdom or the compassion. Let's go, let's take a look at this. This is, this is fascinating. Let's go to, uh, in the, in the uh, Prophets, Let's go to is the prophet Ezekiel, and let's go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 12. We'll start here. Now, the beginning of the verse, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 28 and verse 1, you have the, the, Lord, the word of the Lord has came, it comes to Ezekiel, and he's addressing the prince of Tyre, which was, as you read the concept, you're reading human leaders of Tyre, which was a great trading nation up in the area we would now call Lebanon. There's still a city called Tyre, okay, from that standpoint, up, up in Lebanon. But then he shifts, okay, the focus of this chapter, it shifts from verse 1 to the prince of Tyre. It shifts in verse 12 to son of man lift up a lamentation over the king of Tyre. 
who was really in charge? <laughs> you know, Paul would talk about, you know, the, the, the principalities, the powers, you know, the, the, these things that govern the world. In Colossians. Anyways, in Ezekiel 28, in verse 12, Son of man, lift up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You seal up the measure of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. This would be kind of a strange thing to say about a human being. You have been in Eden, the garden of God. Oh, okay. Now, it wasn't a contemporary of, of, of Ezekiel or anyone back then. You had been in, in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The ruby, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the turquoise, the emerald and gold. The workmanship of your settings and of your sockets was prepared in you in the day that you were created. So the image that we have here of, of this incredible being whose, whose coverings, you know, were all these incredibly beautiful stones and things like this. Kind of interesting thought about this. And you, and then it says, verse 14, you were the anointed cherub that covers. Okay, here he identifies it. Okay, this the king of Tyre who is not a human being, no, no, not even that. He was, a, he was one of the people that was at the throne of God, one of the beings that was at the throne of God, a created being of enormous power and of enormous beauty and wisdom. You were the anointed cherub that covers, and I set you so. You were upon the holy mountain of God. You have walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. I'm talking about the throne room of God. You were perfect in your ways from the, from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. By the multitude of your merchandise, they have filled your midst with violence and you have sinned. Therefore, I will cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I will destroy you, O covering cherub, from among the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You have corrupted. You have corrupted. Here's that same Hebrew word that is talking about that Edom had corrupted his natural compassions, that here, this covering cherub, Satan, the devil, he had corrupted his wisdom, his strong 7843, his shahath. He had, he, had, he had ruined it. He had spoiled it. Your wisdom, by reason of your brightness, okay, by his vanity, by his ego, by his pride, I will cast you to the ground, and I will lay you before kings that they may behold you. So here we see Edom, that is to say Esau's descendants, had corrupted their human compassions for their brethren. They had spoiled them. They had perverted them. They had ruined them. They had destroyed them. Edom steeled himself, as we might say these days, against his better feelings, his better nature. He deadened his, his, the natural feelings that he should have had for his brother Israel. Back to Amos chapter 1 and verse 11. New Living Translation here this time. This is what the Lord says. The people of Edom have sinned again and again, and I will not let them go unpunished. They chased down their relatives, the Israelites, with swords, showing them no mercy. In their rage, they slashed them continually and were unrelenting in their anger. Or as Amplified would say, his destructive anger raged continually at Israel. He maintained and nurtured his wrath forever. You know, he, he maintained and nurtured it. Or the expanded Bible, they were angry all the time. His anger raged unceasingly. And they kept on being very angry. He preserved his anger. Proverbs, in Proverbs 19.19 says, A man of great wrath will suffer punishment. For if you rescue it from it, you'll have to do it 
again and again. Proverbs 22, 24. I'll cite this one from the Expanded Bible Version. Don't make friends with a quick-tempered people. That is, people controlled by anger. Or spend time with or associate with those who have bad tempers. If you do, you'll, uh, you will be like them. You're going to learn their ways. So then you will be in a real danger. You're going to get yourself trapped. You know, the people we hang out with all the time, if we consider them our friends, you know, people, our peers, that we, you know, we have to, you know, we don't accept anyone uncritically from that standpoint. But we don't want to have people who are quick-tempered as our closest friends and hang out with them all the time because it says, you know, it's, you know, birds of the feather flock together. You don't want to be of that feather, do you? We don't want to be quick-tempered people. We don't want to be people who have bad tempers. That's not what we want to be known as, as Christians, is it? As a nation, Edom, God is accusing Edom of this relentless persecution through his prophet Amos, of inhumanity, of savage fury, of you know, nursing his anger, this persistent, unceasing anger. All through their history, you know, it's seen, you know, in you, biblical history, when you read it, Edom always sided with the enemies of Israel, you know, because obviously they had somehow corrupted and destroyed any sense of compassion. They, they had a bitterness that just went on and on and on and on. And God eventually, he did prophesy in the time of Ezekiel time when everything was looking bad for Israel, by the way, you know, politically speaking at that time, because Israel was by no means perfect. But God said this, because he has a, he has, he has a future in mind for different people for different reasons. But in, in Ezekiel chapter 35, he says this, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Mount Seir, that is, Edom the descendants of Esau, and prophesy against it and, and say unto it, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, Edom, I am against you, and I will stretch out my hand against you, and I will make you a desolation and a waste, and I will raise your cities, and you shall be desolate, and you shall know that I am the Lord, because you have had a perpetual hatred and have delivered the children of Israel in unto the power of the sword at the time of their calamity, at the time of their final punishment. And when Babylon came in, you know, the Edomites, you know, served as auxiliaries with it. You see that repeatedly in the course of history. They would get together in, you know, in conspiracies to fight against Israel. You know, the scriptures have quite a bit to say about that. Verse 6, Therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, I will prepare you for blood, and blood shall pursue you. Since you have not hated blood, even blood shall pursue you. See, this is, you know, when you have terrorists, when you have people who are, you know, they, you know they're bloody people, they want to wage war, they, they, you know, they, they enjoy doing this, they enjoy killing people who they consider their enemies. And you, see, you look at the Middle East right now, and you've, you, know, you, you could fill in the blanks. He's saying that God is saying, since you have not hated blood, even blood shall pursue you. Thus I will make Edom, that is Mount Seir, most desolate, and cut off from it <laughs> the one passing through and the one returning. And I will fill his mountains with the slain. In your hills and in your valleys, all your rivers, those slain with the sword shall fall on them. And I will make you a perpetual desolation forever, and your cities shall not be inhabited. And you shall know that I am the Lord. You know, the, the old capital of Edom, which we now call Petra, you know, it, it's a tourist monument from this standpoint. You know, you go through, it's just ruins, right? People go through, you know, and you go outside of what the capital is. They all have a little tourist, you know, town there that they have there. But it's just for people coming to look at the, the ruins, to look at the desolation. Verse 10, because you said these two nations, and God is saying, because you said, Edom, you, this, this is what you said, these two nations and these two lands shall be mine. I want the land. You have people saying that today, by the way. We shall possess it. And yet the Lord was there. 
<laughs> God, see, God hears this. <laughs> he knows this. And it's still going on right now in the Middle East. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord, I will even do according to your anger and according to your envy, which you have shown out of your hatred against them. And I will make myself known among them when I have judged you. And you shall know that I am the Lord. Okay, Edom, you're going to know that I am the Lord. I have heard all your blasphemies which you have spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, because they are laid desolate, they are given to us to consume. So with your mouth. Of course, what happened after Israel was destroyed, you know, by the Babylonians, you, you see they made a play for it. And then when the Romans kicked them all out, you know, by the time when the Romans did this and for the first and second, well, actually there are three rebellions, but anyways, not to go get off the track, they would again come and take it, you know, and they were there till you know, the late 19th, early 20th century when the Jews decided to return to the promised land and had an opportunity to do so. There's, but they said, this, is, this land's ours. You know, it doesn't belong to you. It's, it's ours now. We want it. In fact, we're going to deny you wherever here. <laughs> you know, it, we, because they are laid desolate, they are given to us to consume. So with your mouth, you have boasted yourself against me and have multiplied your words against me, and I have heard them. Thus is the Lord God. The whole earth rejoices when I shall make you a desolation. Wow. As you rejoiced at the inheritance of the house of Israel because of its desolation, so I will do unto you. This is the question, you know, you see your enemy having a bad time, don't sit there, woohoo, you know, hop up. God doesn't like that. He doesn't like it. You shall be a desolation, O Mount Seir, Edom, and all Idumea, even all of it, and they shall know that I am the Lord. God has his way of dealing with people. The scriptures say we can be angry, but we must not sin. What are we to be angry at? We're not to be angry because we covet what is our brothers or what is a neighbor's, whatever it might be. Ephesians 4 and verse, let's go to Ephesians 4 and verse 25. Ephesians 4 and verse 25, Amplified Bible version. Apostle Paul said this in his circular letter that he wrote at that time when he was in Ephesus. He was probably in prison at the time that he wrote this. Ephesians 4 and verse 25, start with Amplified. Therefore, saying to the church, rejecting all falsehood. And falsehood can be whether lying or defrauding, telling half-truths, spreading rumors, fake news, <laughs> any of these, rejecting all forms of falsehood, speak truth, each one with his neighbor. For we are all parts of one another. That is, we're all parts of the body of Christ. We're all relatives. We're all brethren in the church. You know, you, you shouldn't, you know, it's like, you know, Jacob and, and Esau, they were brethren they should have helped each other. In the church of God today, we're brethren. Do we help each other? Do we have the brotherly compassion and feeling? Verse 26, be angry. Paul said, okay, brethren, you know, church members, okay, I'm giving you, I'm authorizing you, be angry. The Amplified notes what? Angry at what? At sin at immorality, at injustice, at ungodly behavior, the things that God is angry about. Remember, well, I talked about this a little earlier. We are going to be, we should be angry with the God God is angry with. God is a God of love, but he also gets angry by the things that are just destroying peace, that are destroying beauty, that's destroying his creation, that is destroying human lives, that is causing misery and pain and suffering. Be angry you know, angry at sin. But he says this, be angry, yet do not sin. Okay, this is, this, is, this is what we need to pay attention to as Christians. Be angry, but yet do not sin. Do not let your anger, okay, last. Okay, don't let it cause you shame. Don't allow it to continue. Don't nurse it. Don't steal it up. Don't, you know, 
you know, keep it from, you know, hot and alive, you know, poke it and tear those scabs off. Don't do that. Be angry yet do not sin. Don't let your anger last until the sun goes down. So we're not to live in a state of just resentfulness and, and anger. Why is that? Verse 27, Paul says, and do not give the devil an opportunity. Opportunity to do what? To lead you into sin by holding a grudge, by letting you stifle compassion, letting you stifle what doing what is right, letting you corrupt these things that you know God wants you to do. And that gives the devil opportunity. Just like he stifled and destroyed and corrupted his wisdom, and he inspired the Edomites to stifle and, 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 you know, and corrupt, destroy their compassion that they should have had for their neighbors, for, for, their, for their distant relatives, the Jews and the Israelites, the, Is, the Hebrews. And do not give the, do, the devil an opportunity to hold a grudge, to continue nurturing anger, harboring resentment, cultivating bitterness like the Edomites, like we see that continues to go on in our very day. Verse 31, Ephesians 4, verse 31. Let all bitterness, the Greek word here is pikria, Strong's 4088. Let all bitterness, pikria, that is let all harshness, all resentment. Let all bitterness, harshness, resentment, and wrath, Strong's here is 2372, it's thumos, wrath. Thumos, let all, you know, this is passion-driven behavior. Actions coming out of strong impulses, intense emotions, used of people, the lexicon says it indicates rage, personal venting of anger. Let all bitterness, let all picria, and wrath, thumos, and anger, this is Strong's 3709, or gay, which is, that is settled anger, you know, your opposition rising from an ongoing fixed opposition, like the Edomites had against Israel, as well as, you know, the resentment. They had all these, Picria, Thumos, or gay. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor this is Strong's 2906. It's Kroge, this, this loud crying done with great you know, pathos and emotion, this clamorous screaming and shrieking. You get the picture. It's all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and slander be put away from you. You all know what slander is, don't we? Along with every kind of malice. That's spitefulness, verbal abuse, malevolence. You know, it's this, it's this, with this underlying inspiration of evil. It's an inherent evil, which is present even if it's not outwardly expressed. There is this malevolence, this malice. Always trying to get them. That's what Edom had towards Israel. They had this, they harbored this malice. But it says this, verse 32, Ephesians 4, 32. Instead, you know, it's like you hear the opposite. Be kind and helpful to one another, tender-hearted. Hey, to your brethren. You know, don't follow the example of the Edomites. Be kind and helpful to one another, tender-hearted. Nurture your compassion. Don't suppress it. Don't strangle it. Don't stifle it. Forgiving one another. You know, it's kind of interesting because the scriptures say that for a while it seemed like Esau forgave Jacob. You know, there when he came back into the land and Jacob sent him these presents. And, but it obviously, <laughs> it, was, it, it obviously wasn't really there. Just as Christ in, God in Christ also forgave you. Now, that's the end of chapter 4 in Ephesians, but really there were no chapter breaks when Paul wrote this, 
this was only later. And what does it say here? Continue on in, in, chat, in Ephesians 5, 1. It said, therefore become imitators of God. That is copy God. You know, imitatio Christo, you know, in, in, in Latin. That is imitating Christ, one of these great principles of what it means to be a Christian disciple. Therefore, become imitators of God. You know, we want to follow him as our father. We don't want to, to follow the devil as his, you know, father. You know, Jesus used to rail on, you know, some of the Pharisees and the others who, you know, they'd see him do a miracle and they'd say, oh, we saw him heal right in front of us, this guy, but we want to go and kill him. You know, who is that? Those people, you know, stifled, they strangled they, their compassion. Their father was a devil. He, he seems to be an expert at that sort of thing and inspiring his, those who follow him in the same sort of attitude. Therefore, become imitators of God as well-beloved children and walk continually in love. See, w to walk continually in love. See, it's just the opposite. Instead of being continually in this wrath, this, this hatred, you know, all those negative things, instead walk continually in love. Practicing empathy and compassion, unselfishness, seeking what's best for others. It's just the opposite. Just as Christ also loved you and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God, a sweet fragrance. Let's close with a scripture here very that we're all very familiar with. Let's read in Galatians. Let's go to Galatians here. Galatians chapter 5. We know this. It's always good to read, though. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. Now this I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You don't, you don't want to copy the example of Edom. For as the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit lusts against the flesh, and these things are opposed to each other, so that you cannot do those things you wish to do, because, yeah, it's not easy. In the real world, you know, from the standpoint, we, we are in a contest. We are struggling day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, to do, you know, to imitate our Heavenly Father. Not the uh, covering cherub who corrupted his wisdom. But if you were led by a spirit, we're not under the law. No, we're not under the condemnation. We're not, we're, not, we're not bound for punishment. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, licentiousness, idolatry, witchcraft. And then it includes, of course, hatred, strifes, jealousies, indignations, contentions, divisions, sex, Envies, murders, drugness, relevings, and these and such things as these, concerning which I am telling you beforehand, even as I have said in the past, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. See, Edom, Edom, you know, nourished, nourished suppressed his normal human compassion and nourished anger instead. God's, you know, God has a response to that. God's justice is to punish it. And he's not going to, the people who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There are a lot of people who are practicing falsehood these days who are saying you will, but it's not so. Instead, we, you know, don't let you know, don't let the spirit of this age cause you to miss out in your future. Do not have you to be the harbor malice. Don't you know? Don't you know? You don't want to. You don't want to practice. Or, you know. You don't want to keep any evil thoughts or evil speeches. No, the spirit of God is the opposite of those things. Imitate God is and imitating God's means. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Yeah. 
God didn't have to inspire Moses to write any laws against those things. No, obviously not. Because they're God's spirit. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh and its passions and lusts. And if we live in the spirit, we also have to walk in the spirit. Let us be tenderhearted. Let's follow this exhortation of what Paul has to say and avoid the lesson, as it were, of Edom who nourished his anger and his resentment and his bitterness, his clamor and his wrath. Instead, we want to be forgiving. We want to be kind. We want to be patient. We want the fruits of the spirits. That is what we want to imitate. God is our Father. We don't want to, ex uh, we don't want to from that standpoint, imitate the King of Tyre. Let us imitate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all of those who are true members of the household of God. Let us show this compassion. Hate what is evil, but cling and practice what is good.